I did not fact her. It's not true. It's bullsh**. I did not fact her. I did not. Oh, hi, mother factors. My name is Sam, and today I have the distinct honor of talking to you all about the best worst movie ever made, The Room. There are scarcely the words in any known human language to accurately describe the beautiful atrocity that is The Room, so let's just get straight into it, shall we? Why are spoons so integral to the viewing of this film? Which member of the cast became an Olympian? And when's the sequel trilogy coming out? Star Wars has got one, I don't see how The Room should be any different. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so fire up the green screen, break out the old pig skin and say Hi doggy. As we prepare for 101 facts about the room. <laughs> Number one. In case you thought this video was going to be about the award winning 2015 movie Room, well it ain't. Although that is a great film too. You go Brie Larson. But no, this video is about a movie entitled The Room, released in 2003 and considered by many to be something of an accidental masterpiece. Of sorts. It's repeatedly been called the greatest bad movie ever made. Number 2. The film was directed by a genuinely mysterious fellow by the name of Tommy Wiseau. Who is this man here? Looking good, Tommy. But let's check out the rest of the crew. Number 3. The film was produced by a truly legendary Hollywood icon, um, Tommy Wiseau. Okay, yeah, I guess Wiseau produced the film too. Well, the job of a director-producer is to realise the creative vision of a talented writer, so who was that? Number four. The room was penned by one of Hollywood's finest penners too, a guy by the name of... Oh right, no, sorry, it was Tommy Wiseau again. Wow, big fan of auteur theory, hey Tommy? Number five. It also stars Tommy Wiseau too in the main role of Johnny, because of course it does. The rest of the main cast is made up of other people you almost certainly haven't heard of up until now, such as Juliette Danielle as Lisa, Greg Sestero as Mark, and who could forget Philip Haldeman as the real star of the show, Denny, who... I don't know, what does Denny do? Like, what is the point of Denny? Anyway, the film attempts to tell the story of a love triangle between Johnny, his fiancée Lisa, and his best friend Mark. Number six. According to Wiseau himself, the title The Room refers to the fact a room can contain good and bad things, which, yep, he's not wrong. Can't fault him there, I guess. That's sort of reflected in the film, sort of. Number seven. Greg Sestero has since described the film as an advisory warning about the perils of having friends, whatever the hell that means. Apparently having friends is perilous? <laughs> That's good, because I don't have any. So, who's the real winner? Number 8. A huge part of why the film has found such a unique reputation comes from the utter mystery surrounding Wiseau himself. Wiseau has insisted for years that he comes from America, despite his strange, obviously foreign accent. He previously claimed he was from Norlins in Louisiana, despite the fact he sounds more Eastern European than Cajun. Like, he clearly was not born in the United States. At all. Maybe he was hatched. Number 9. Even his friend and co-star, Greg Sestero, was never able to get an honest answer out of him. Although he has revealed that Wiseau is not his original last name, and was probably inspired by the French word for bird, which is Wezo. Apparently, people close to him, or as close as you can get to the utter chuffing enigma that is Tommy Wiseau, say that when he first came to the United States, he called himself Pierre. Sure, why not? Number 10. A Reddit user by the hilariously apt name Oh Bye Mark claims to have discovered his original nationality. After a not insignificant amount of sleuthing, they discovered that Wazan was apparently born and raised in Poland, and his surname was originally Vechor. The more you know. Number 11. <laughs> However, in a momentous 2017 interview on Jimmy Kimmel Live, Wazan admitted for the first time he's originally from Europe, though now he considers himself an American. And I mean, to be fair, if anyone embodies the American dream, it's Tommy Mother Wazo. Number 12. Greg Sestero eventually wrote a tell-all book about the development and production of The Room in 2013, entitled The Disaster Artist. A lot of what is known about The Room comes directly from this book, though Wiseau himself has said the book is only 40% true. The Disaster Artist is also the basis of an upcoming film about Wiseau in The Room, and don't worry, we'll be getting to that. Patience. Number 13. Funnily enough, <laughs> The Room originally wasn't going to be a movie, but a stage play. This goes some way to explain the title of The Room, as it was going to be a play in which everything happened in one room. Number 14. The Room is also a 1.500 page novel. 
It's apparently the same story, but much, much more detail orientated. Wazo has stated that it will eventually be published, and hey, anything's possible, right? Number 15. Incredibly, the film, which looks like a particularly well made university project, has a budget of six million dollars. Yep, six. Six million. Most of this went on production and marketing, which is like literally everything else about the room. Absolutely baffling. Number 16. Even more baffling is the fact that this six million dollars was all Wiseau's own money. Exactly where he got all this money remains somewhat uncertain, although according to Entertainment Weekly, he claims to have made a fortune importing and selling leather jackets from Korea. Wiseau refuses to elaborate any further on the subject, which, that could mean anything. Let me know in the comments below what you think, but be careful, because he might see you. Number 17. According to Sestero's book, however, Wizzo financed the film after becoming independently wealthy from years of entrepreneurship and working in real estate. I mean, that seems more likely, but still, could be anything. Could be an international supervillain that we just don't know about, because he has that look. Number 18. The main reason the film was so expensive was because the cast and crew were constantly being replaced. Numerous members of the production team were so frustrated by perceived incompetence on the part of Rizzo that they simply quit, some within only a few days of working on the film. Number 19. So, we know the room is about a turbulent love triangle, but what is it really about, man? Well, according to Sestero in his book, the character of Lisa is based on a real woman to whom Tommy Rizzo had once proposed, but betrayed him on numerous occasions, resulting in the collapse of their relationship. Oh, real life Lisa, look at what you could have won. Number 20. Day. On the very first day of filming, Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero showed up to set several hours late. Apparently, Greg arrived on time to pick Tommy up, but he was never a particularly punctual person and was not even close to being ready. Wiseau himself was a routine three to four hours late throughout the entire production. Number 21. He almost immediately began to bark orders at the production crew, suggesting they were working too slowly and were being unprofessional. Once again, people, this was on the very first day, when he was four hours late. Number 22. Another bizarre tidbit about the film, the room was shot simultaneously on 35mm film and high definition video. This was because Wiseau was confused about the differences between the two formats, so rather than simply learn about the difference and choose one, he used both cameras on the same mount, which Chester o has since called wasteful and completely pointless. <laughs> yep, I'm tired, I'm wasted. It's number 23. The film buffs among you will know that even the largest productions tend to rent camera equipment from dedicated suppliers. Not Tommy Wiseau, baby! Wiseau purchased the cameras outright, and hey, when you have a seemingly bottomless supply of money, why not spend it entirely unnecessarily? It's what I'd do. Number 24. Greg Sestero's character, Mark, was named after Matt Damon. Now, you may have already figured out that the name Mark is not in fact the name Matt. Apparently, Wiseau was a big fan of Damon's acting, but originally misheard the name as Mark Damon. <laughs> oh, you can't make it up, can you? Number 25. Apparently, Sestero originally refused the role of Mark because of the gratuitous sex scenes which were making him extremely uncomfortable. He and Wiseau compromised by allowing him to wear jeans during Mark's more sexy moments with Lisa. Number 26. In his book, Sestero explains that he also worked as a line producer on The Room, despite lacking any knowledge or experience about what that would entail. This means that on top of being one of the main characters in the film, he was also in charge of making sure everyone was paid, sorting out meals, and other general organisation that needed to be done. Sestero claims that he was really the only person who could speak Tommy's language, and to his credit, Wiseau has since stated that Sestero did a great job, so well done, Mark. Number 27. Something you may not know about the room is the character of Lisa was originally named Blondie. I assume that's because of her blonde hair, but you never know with the room, he may have actually assumed that Debbie Harry would be available. Number 28. Not only that, the part of Lisa was originally given to an unidentified actress whom Wiseau later fired, after which he gave the role to Juliette Danielle, who had originally been cast as Lisa's best friend, Michelle. All very confusing, like many other facts about the room, because it's absolutely nuts. Number 29. Danielle also stated that Wiseau told her to prepare for the film by watching Stanley Kubrick's 1999 erotic classic, Eyes Wide Shut, but he never explained why. Both films are vaguely about sexual relationships, but they're hardly similar. Danielle admitted that, even after many years, she still doesn't know what he was trying to do, which is a pretty apt description of the room in general. Number 30. Wiseau gave the costume designer such a tiny budget that she was forced to go to thrift shops to procure garments for the cast to wear. 
That might explain why Wazo was wearing pretty much the same thing in every single shot, or it might just be Wazo being Wazo. Number 31. When it was pointed out to Wazo that the set looked far too sparsely furnished to appear realistic, he sent the art department out to buy various items to dress the set up a bit. The photo frames they purchased came with various stock photos of plastic spoons. So that filming could continue as soon as possible, an impatient Wazo ordered that the frames be put straight into the scene without changing the spoon images. Which is why there are so many scenes throughout the film which inexplicably contain photos of spoons. Framed photos of spoons too. There are a grand total of 34 spoon shots. Number 32. A notable moment in the film occurs when Johnny walks into the bathroom, the morning after making excruciatingly passionate love to Lisa, and Wiseau's bare backside is on display for all to see. In fact, that backside is a bit too visible throughout the film. Sestero claims that Wiseau insisted on the shot being included in the movie, declaring that I had to show my ass or the movie won't sell, which, in retrospect, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Number 33. Probably the most famous line in the entire film comes from Johnny, surprise surprise, when he walks out onto the roof after Lisa has accused him of hitting her and emphatically declares, Did not hit her. It's not true. It's bull I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Sestero claims that it took Wizzo no less than 32 takes to correctly deliver this line. <laughs> oh, amazing. Number 34. In fact, Wiseau was so bad at memorising his lines, which, let me remind you, he wrote, he often required the use of cue cards. Even then, much of the film's dialogue had to be dubbed in, which is why there are so many scenes, particularly those involving Johnny, in which the dialogue is entirely out of sync and incongruous with his lips. Number 35. A lot of people are confused by the character of Denny, who is always showing up unannounced and making inappropriate advances, especially towards Lisa. My god, that poor woman can't catch a break. Well, apparently his strange behaviour can be explained by the fact that Wizzo wrote the character of Denny as mentally handicapped. Unfortunately, Wizzo never thought to mention this to Philip Haldeman, the actor who plays Denny. Classic Wizzo power move. Number 36. Speaking of Denny, fun fact, and believe me, there's a lot more of those on the way, the actor who plays Denny was older than both Sestero and Danielle, who played Mark and Lisa. Number 37. One of the most endearing aspects of the room is the awkward, confusing, and often inexplicable dialogue, which never stops being utterly mental throughout the whole film. The phrase, oh hi, is spoken a total of nine times, and the related, oh hey, seven times. That's too many. Moonlight won Best Picture at the Oscars. I don't think the words, oh hi, even said in that once. Number 38. Additionally, Lisa says, I don't want to talk about it. A total of five times, twice to Claudette, once to Johnny, once to Michelle and Stephen collectively, and once to Michelle only. The exact same phrase is said by the same character five times in one movie. Number 39. Another bizarre feature in the dialogue is that, although Johnny and Lisa are engaged, no one ever used the standard term fiancé when talking about them. They use the phrases future wife and future husband instead. It sounds so minor, but when you're watching the film, it's noticeable and it's weird. Number 40. As you can imagine, the crew was often forced to hold back laughter upon witnessing the pure insanity that was unfolding before them. Apparently, on a number of occasions, the cameraman laughed so hard that he couldn't keep still, causing the camera to shake during takes. That explains a lot. Number 41. Danielle claims that one line in particular, the infamous In a few minutes, which occurs when Johnny is sat in the bathroom with his back to the door, caused the crew to erupt into such loud fits of laughter that Wiseau came out of the bathroom demanding to know what was so funny, because obviously, he had no idea. The meaning of life. Filming for The Room, which features a relatively small cast and takes place in only a handful of locations, took over six months. Again, the fact that the cast and crew members were constantly abandoning the project probably didn't help. And by probably, I mean definitely. And by didn't help, I mean, was the cause thereof. Number 43. After filming the first graphic, gratuitous, bizarre love scene, Wiseau decided to write in a second one, but the actress playing Lisa was so uncomfortable with the idea of filming another one, she refused. Wiseau decided to create the second love scene with unused footage from the first, which explains why they look almost identical. Number 44. As you can imagine, the movie's bizarre, um, aesthetic is not just a result of Wiseau's creative choices. The room is filled with blatant production errors, including whole scenes that are entirely out of focus. Literally no one bothered to check if the entire scene was in focus, guys. Number 45. 
Wiseau insisted that the scenes to take place on the rooftop would be shot on a set with a green screen, despite the fact that an actual rooftop was available throughout filming. Just go with it, don't, don't try to understand it. Number 46. Part of the reason that Dan Janjagan's performance as the violent drug dealer Chris R is so convincing is because he found Wiseau so irritating. Wiseau got on his nerves so severely that the anger you see on screen is completely genuine. I can't believe he was snubbed of that Oscar. I mean, he should have been at least nominated for Chris R. Number 47. Not only that, Janjagan stayed in character the entire time he was on set. His commitment to the role was so profound that the other actors report being genuinely scared of him. He was so terrifying they were scared of him and not Wiseau. I mean, oh. Number 48. Funnily enough, he was the only actor in the whole cast with no prior acting experience. His employment history included working as a motivational speaker and a serial entrepreneur. As in, he was an entrepreneur a lot. Not that his entrepreneurialism was directed at serial specifically. Number 49. The room aficionados will remember the scene in which Johnny sets up recording equipment to catch Lisa admitting to being unfaithful. Sestero has since revealed that Wiseau actually used this very same tape recorder to tape every phone conversation he has, which, I mean, just knowing that is amazing, isn't it, really? Number 50. Another of Wiseau's baffling directorial edict was his insistence that the entire cast be present during the filming of every scene, even those that their character had absolutely no involvement in. This was in case Wiseau suddenly felt like throwing them in the background for some reason. Number 51. Sestero also recalls one occasion when Wiseau was genuinely furious at a crew member for the egregious crime of farting on set. Sestero has stated several times that Wiseau is genuinely fartphobic and says that it's absolutely disgusting. Hey, it's not nice, but we all do it, baby. We all do it. Number 52. Hilariously, if you go back and watch the film again, you may notice that everything that happens between the second sex scene and the birthday party have absolutely no effect on the film's already anemic plot. Number 53. Amazingly, but not at all surprisingly, the film's original script was significantly longer than the one that ended up on film and featured several lengthy monologues. The script supervisor, played by Seth Rogen in the movie, but we'll get to that later, and several members of the cast edited the whole thing down while on set, finding much of the dialogue to be incomprehensible. One cast member, who for unknown yet totally known reasons wanted to remain anonymous, told Entertainment Weekly that the original script contained stuff that was just unsayable. They continued by saying, I know it's hard to imagine there was stuff that was worse, but there was. Number 54. Kyle Vogt, the actor who played Peter the Psychologist, left the production before all his scenes were completed because of a prior acting commitment, about which he'd informed Wiseau months before. Wiseau had assured Vox that filming in the room would be completed well before this other job was scheduled. But that obviously didn't happen, which explains why Peter isn't at the party towards the end of the film. Number 55. Instead, Peter's lines were given to a completely new character called Steven, who unexpectedly shows up at Johnny's birthday party with literally no introduction whatsoever. He just kind of shows up out of nowhere. No character development, no establishment in the plot, nothing. Incidentally, one of Peter's last lines is, That's it, I'm done. <laughs> How apt. How apt. Number 56. Johnny's trademark line, You are tearing me apart, Lisa! was inspired by an almost identical line from the 1955 film Rebel Without a Cause. You are tearing me apart! Wiseau considers Dean's performance in that film to be one of his main inspirations. Number 57. Sestero says while filming the fight between Johnny and Mark, Wiseau really was actually genuinely hurting him, and by the end of it, he had bruises all over his arms and wrists. Sestero describes Wiseau as having a cyborg-like strength, which makes me slightly nervous given that I've spent 15 minutes of this video basically taking the piss out of him. Number 58. Surprisingly, but also entirely unsurprisingly, prior to filming of the scenes in which Johnny confronts Mark and then trashes his own apartment, Tommy Wiseau had taken a buttload of NyQuil as he'd been suffering from a stuffed nose and a sore throat. That, combined with a severe lack of sleep, explains why Johnny looks so convincingly out of it, resulting in one of the most lethargic room trashing scenes in cinematic history, with Johnny listlessly stomping around, knocking things over like a bored Godzilla. Number 59. One of the most bizarre things about the room that didn't actually make it into the final film was that Wiseau originally intended for the film to contain, and this is 100% true by the way, a subplot in which Johnny turns out to be a vampire. Wiseau eventually decided to drop this idea after realising that there was no way they could possibly afford to film a scene in which Johnny lifts a car and throws it across the San Francisco skyline, revealing his true vampiric nature. Although if he did, that would have been one of the greatest twists in cinematic history. Number 60. 
If you look at the credits of the film, both at the very beginning and after the film's finished, a guy by the name of Drew Caffrey is credited as an executive producer, as well as a casting agent, script supervisor, and an assistant to Mr. Wiseau. According to Sestero, Caffrey was a father figure type to Wiseau, who he met in San Francisco. The main problem with this is that Drew Caffrey died in 1999, three years before the film was made. Number 61. When the film was completed, Wizzo used his seemingly endless funds to make his film's premiere as big and flashy as he possibly could. He bought spotlights for the venue, rocked up in a white limousine, and gifted his leading lady Juliet Daniel with a jewel-encrusted black dress. Very similar to the dress I gave Jennifer Lawrence once, although that does explain why I found it in a thrift shop. Number 62. Unfortunately, excitement quickly turned to cringe as the lovable disaster they'd created unfolded on screen. Sestero couldn't bear to watch his love scene with Danielle, and left before the scene began. Even today, the actor claims he always fast-forwards the scene or runs for the exit before it comes on, because he considers it just painful to watch. Number 63. Danielle was also shocked by the lengthy love scenes, naively assuming they would only be a couple of seconds. Like they are in real life. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean they're not? Instead, in the film though, they turned out to be several minutes long. Several minutes. It feels like hours though. Nintendo 64. In a way, she's lucky they were as short as they were. Wizzo was so pleased with the footage, he wanted to include all of it in the film, and literally had to be talked out of it by the editor. The first Rumpy Pumpy scene featuring Johnny and Lisa was originally nearly six minutes long. Number 65. Even after everyone's completely correct suspicions were confirmed and the film turned out to be truly exceptionally terrible, the cast was still overwhelmed by a crowd of people begging for their autographs. The actors realised immediately that Wiseau had paid people to accost them, which actually does make total and complete sense. Number 66. Sestero claims that Wiseau even submitted the film to Paramount in the hope of securing them as the film's distributor. Usually, responses can take roughly two weeks, but the room was rejected within 24 hours. Awkward. Also, dang Paramount, look what you could have won. Number 67. Another iconic part of the room's mystique involves the existence of a billboard advertisement for the film that Wizzo had erected on Highland Avenue in Los Angeles. For some mind-boggling reason, Wizzo paid to keep the billboard up for over five years, at a cost of $5,000 a month, eventually costing Wizzo somewhere in the region of $300,000. How does this story get weirder? Number 68. Wizzo likes to call the photo used in the billboard, Evil Man which features a dramatic image of Wiseau's face with one eye partially closed. Wiseau's creepy visage led many to believe that The Room was a horror film. The billboard's peculiar imagery and baffling longevity led to it becoming a minor tourist attraction. So we want about Wiseau, he's a good marketer. Number 69. Six minutes. Wiseau also paid for a small television and print campaign in and around Los Angeles, with a now infamous tagline which called The Room a film with the passion of Tennessee Williams. I mean, it certainly has passion. No argument there. Almost six minutes of passion, in fact. Number 70. Sources differ slightly on the exact number of theatres at which the room originally played, ranging from a handful down to literally only one. Regardless, the room ended up making only $1,800 at the box office. And just remember, if that seems good, this cost over $6 million to make. Number 71. The film lasted only two weeks in the cinema before being pulled out of circulation. It may not have even been that long were it not for Wizzo, who kept it playing long enough to make it eligible for the Academy Awards. It ended up not winning anything at the Academy Awards. It wasn't even nominated, honestly. Injustice! Number 79. Uh, two. Seven, uh, <laughs> Number 72. And thus, we are left with the question of why the film has become so well known, considering the fact it's pretty much the opposite of a good movie in every conceivable way. Well, that's just it. The film isn't famous, it's infamous. Infamous. With a cult following developing out of its so bad it's good quality, The Room has been called the Citizen Kane of bad movies, as well as the best worst movie ever. Number 73. The film's unexpected fame began as the result of one man, Michael Rousselet, who happens to be a member of the comedy film troupe Five Second Films. Rousselet was one of the very few people who actually went to see the film in an absolutely empty theatre, no less. When the film ended, he immediately called all his friends to tell them about the cinematic gem that the world was about to completely forget. Number 74. Rousselet implored his friends to come and watch The Room, and in a matter of days, saw it with a crowd of over 100 people. A number of these people decided to email Wiseau thanking him for the movie, which prompted the enigmatic director to set up a midnight screening. 
Attendance to the event surpassed his wildest expectations, after which Wizzo decided to set up monthly showings of the soon-to-be film classic. Number 75 As the film's cult following grew, a number of viewing traditions arose, which allow for a truly immersive cinematic experience. Audience members often dress up as the characters and toss footballs to each other as a nod to the ubiquitous presence of the sport throughout the film, and indeed in these transitions. Number 76 Another such tradition involves all the aforementioned pictures of plastic spoons that can be seen in Johnny's flat. Whenever there's a shot that includes the infamous spoon photos, fans shout, SPOONS! and throw plastic spoons at the screen, often leaving the theatre completely covered in them by the end of the night. As an ex-cinema rusher, my god that must have been irritating. Number 77 Audiences also loudly count along, with the seven mentions of Johnny and Mark being best friends. However, it's not uncommon for attendees to be wasted after the first few mentions. I'm tired, I'm wasted, I love you darling. And the chants only become more and more uncertain and chaotic as the film progresses. Number 78 Some known celebrity fans of the room include Paul Rudd, David Cross, Jonah Hill, Edgar Wright, Michael Sarah, Tim Heidegger, Eric Wareheim, Patton Oswalt, Jolo Trujillo, Kristen Bell, and me. I'm a celebrity. I'm nearly on famous birthdays. Number 79 As a result of the film's cult status and now regular screenings taking place all over the world, the room has since made back all of its insane $6 million budget and is now amazingly in profit. For a film famed for being unremittingly awful, it's become and has continued to be a genuine success. Number 80 In 2011, a stage play based on the movie's original script was performed, with both Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero both reprising their parts. More performances are planned, with Wiseau and Sestero due to appear at the Prince Charles Theatre in London with a show in 2018. I will do anything for a ticket. Number 81 when asked why there are so many scenes in the room which include characters playing catch with a football, Wizzo simply responded that football is fun, which isn't an answer, but it's as close to an answer as we can reasonably expect. Number 82 Wizzo says that Lisa's mother makes a full recovery from her breast cancer. Oh, did we not cover that? Yeah, at one point, Lisa's mother Claudette very calmly states, I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. The reason why I had to say that Wiseau said that she was alright in the end is because this is never mentioned again in the film. Number 83 Since the film's release, Wiseau has claimed he always intended the film to be comedic. In reality though, we may never know for sure. Frankly, it's his word against literally every other member of the cast and crew, so who knows? Number 84 on one occasion, Wizzo insisted that the midnight screening of The Room, and I'm quoting exactly here, eliminated crime in America. During an interview with Gorka, he made the bizarre claim that people who chose not to see The Room could be out on the street, where accidents happen, and they might get arrested. I mean, <laughs> that's true for all films, right? Number 85 In addition to The Room being a film, a book, and a stage play, Wizzo has also expressed his intention to adapt the movie into a Broadway musical. <laughs> Nothing on the face of planet Earth would give me greater joy. Except for Jennifer Lawrence marrying me, maybe. But even then, it's a close second. Number 86 Clearly, Wizzo has done the smart thing and capitalised on the unexpected fame he has accrued since The Room was released. Wizzo has his own web store where he sells various room-themed items, including watches, t-shirts, and Tommy Wiseau underwear. Okay. Number 87 Bafflingly, and frankly the fact I'm baffled by all these facts should be assumed at this point, Wizzo even set up his own dating site called TheRoomDating.com. The site has absolutely nothing to do with his film. When asked about it, Wizzo responded, Well, we're promoting the underwear. What? 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 Number 88 The Room has also been adapted into an unofficial online video game entitled The Room Tribute. Released in 2010 on Newgrounds.com, it's designed in the retro style of 16-bit graphics, and is a point-and-click role-playing adventure game. Poetically, the game has received great reviews from a number of publications, including Time, Wired, and Destructoid. Number 89 After witnessing The Room's initial burst of fame, filmmaker Rick Harper decided to make a full documentary about The Room, beautifully titled Room Full of Spoons. Initially, Harp had Wiseau's blessing, but he eventually grew increasingly displeased with the film, and it's now under an injunction preventing it from being released. Ha! <laughs> Psych! Actually, a judge lifted the injunction in late 2017. Number 90 
In what is possibly the greatest news since the resurrection of Christ, Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero are reuniting 14 years after the release of The Room in a new movie, entitled Best Friends Fiends. I don't know how to say that title. The film is due to be released in early 2018 and features Sestero as a drifter who befriends a mysterious mortician who is, of course, played by Tommy Wiseau. May God have mercy upon our souls. Number 91. In 2015, an instalment of the popular advice column Ask Amy unwittingly featured a hoax letter that described the plot of the room from the perspective of Johnny, and included a number of the film's famous quotes. Ask Amy took the letter seriously and recommended that Johnny break up with Lisa. <laughs> Duh. Number 92. The Room has also inspired a major Hollywood feature film entitled The Disaster Artist. The film takes most of its inspiration from Greg Sestero's tell-all book of the same name, and stars Dave Franco as Greg, his brother James Franco as Tommy, and a number of other well-known actors such as Seth Rogen, Alison Brie, and Paul Scheer. Number 93. Sestero claims that Wiseau has previously stated that the only two actors who could play him in an adaptation would be James Franco or Johnny Depp. It seems Johnny Depp wasn't available. Number 94. Luckily, there doesn't seem to be any debate about the casting of Greg. Both Wiseau and Sestero himself gave their approvals of the casting of Dave Franco as Greg Sestero. Number 95. Additionally, Greg Sestero appears in the movie as a casting agent. Haha, <laughs> finally getting the role he deserves. Number 96. Like Wiseau many years before him, James Franco both starred in and directed this film and endeavoured to speak like Wiseau throughout filming, in order to make the process more fluid. He even gave direction in Wiseau's distinctive and unique voice and syntax. Number 97. Seth Rogen has since admitted on The Howard Stern Show that he had a hard time being directed by Franco while he maintained Wiseau's humorous cadence. Rogen said he often struggled to contain his laughter, but Franco told him he would eventually get used to it, which apparently, somehow, he did. Number 98. Zac Efron, who has a small role in the film as Dan Jajidian, who's the actor who plays Chris R in the room, is only 5 foot 8, whereas the real deal is 6 foot 3. Short men seeing roles made for tall men. Disgusting. Number 99. In almost every interview for The Disaster Artist, James Franco has stated that Tommy Wiseau approves of 99.9% .9 of the film. When asked what issues constituted Wiseau's 0.1% of disapproval, Franco claims that Wiseau objected to the lighting of the first scene and also Franco's apparent inability to properly throw an American football. Wiseau himself appears in a post-credit scene opposite Franco as a new character named Henry. The inclusion of the scene was apparently one of the conditions for Wiseau selling the rights to the film. Number 101. <laughs> Great video, Sam. Lastly, prepare yourself for one of my favourite facts in the whole video, or possibly all time. Dan Jan Jidian, the guy who plays Chris R, competed for Armenia at the 2002 Winter Olympics in the men's two-man bobsleigh event. He and his teammate, Yorgo Alexandru, finished 33rd. Well, what greater metaphor for the room can there be than that? And that was 101 Fact About The Room. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, because if not, you're tearing me apart, motherfuckers! Anyway, let me know what you want to see next in the comments below, and hey, I might just do it. In the meantime, though, check out these videos here. You're really sure to enjoy them. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.